welcome to Southern Fried Asian. I am Keith Chow. On the podcast, I am so honored to have New York Times best-selling author of the books Hotel in the Corner, Bitter and Sweet, The Songs of Will of Frost, Love and Other Consolation Prizes, and this summer, a brand new book coming out, The Many Daughters of Afong Moy. Please welcome to the podcast, my friend, Jamie Ford. Thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, thanks for plugging the new book that's coming out. Of course. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about that one. I should also mention contributor to Secret Identities, the Asian American superhero anthology, because it's funny, you know, when we first, I guess, like, met before you were a big shot, big time author and, and Hotel came out like two months before Secret Identities. We, we kind of rode your coattails a little bit and we were like, oh, yeah, that guy, he's in our book, too. <laughs> uh, no, no one knew what that book would do you know what i mean it was a sleeper hit and that's 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 kind of the best way to go no it was it's amazing and, and it's an honor to to get a chance to talk to you i know it's been a while and for what it's worth i don't know you were born in the pacific northwest but i know you you grew up in the pacific northwest yeah. you currently live in montana and yet you're on the podcast southern fried asian so like either i'm really bad at geography or there's a reason why I'm talking to you on this particular podcast. The South is taking over, man. They've, they've lost the face of Dixon. They're on the march. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of scary, uh, especially considering what happened a year ago around this time. Yeah, but no, true. so I, I recently learned that you have ties to the Ozarks. You have ties to the South. So be yeah. and because of that, and because, like I said, before we started recording, this is my podcast and I can bend the rules. I'm going to have a Southern adjacent fried Asian on the podcast. So, Jamie, can you talk a little bit about your ties to the South and your in your in your own special Southern roots? Yeah, it's uh, I'm I'm really that you know the mix. My dad is Chinese. My mom was born in Whit Springs, Arkansas, which when she lived there had a population of 250. Now it has a population of 54. Wow. So yeah, the town is shrinking and the cemetery is growing and it's. You know, it's just kind of what happens to small towns in America. And then my grandparents lived in Marshall, which is maybe 20 minutes away, which has a population of about 1,200, something like that. Um, was just there, you know, uh, last week uh, visiting family. And, my, you know, my, I asked my uncle, like, like how, how Southern Ozarky were we? You know, when you were born, did you go to the hospital? Did a midwife come out? And he said, basically, we didn't have a car someone had to ride a horse to the nearest neighbor who had a car, which was a Model T. And then they drove to Marshall to get the doctor and brought the doctor out. So all my all my mom and her siblings were all born at home in this little, little tiny Arkansas farmhouse, walking to school, walking everywhere. And ultimately, my family moved from there to Northern California. Like when my mom was maybe 14, 13, 14, and my family, they sold their little farm, which I'm sure wasn't worth a ton. And they went out to California and they became fruit pickers back when white people picked fruit. <laughs> and I know it's like grapes of wrath. This is 100 years ago. How old are you, Jamie? <laughs> I know, right. I'm a time traveler. <laughs> yeah, that's their kind of journey. But I still have family in Arkansas. As I understand it, I have a, a relative from Virginia... The, uh, the Blackwells, that's that side of the family, fought in the War of 1812 and was given a land grant in Missouri as some sort of reward or payment. Went to Missouri, hated Missouri, but had a friend who had property in Arkansas in the Ozarks. And so they traded sight unseen. And that's how my family got to the Ozarks. And I think they've been there for seven generations now. That's wild. One of the things that, that clued me into this part of your backstory that I had no knowledge of until literally like last week is that you posted a photo of yourself as a, as a child in Arkansas, like kind of like hanging out with some cousins. And, and so that, 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 you know, clicked a light in my head that I said, I can get Jamie on this podcast now. I have an excuse. Did you spend a lot of time visiting Arkansas growing up? Yeah, quite a number of times. Or I had Southern relatives come up and, and bring a little... Uh, <laughs> yeah, because we have relatives in Texas and Oklahoma as well. So much of my childhood was spent on those great American road trips where we drove across and saw everybody and then 
luckily, you know, we we came back and hit Disneyland and then drove back. <laughs> that was the excuse. You had to yeah. you had to hit these like small towns before you could get to see Mickey Mouse. But so as you know, as you said, your your mother married your father after moving from Arkansas to to California. And I guess you were born in California before moving to the Northwest, right? Yeah, I was born in Eureka and we moved away when I was like one, so I don't quite remember it. Right. Your but... whole your whole history is is tied to like Seattle, Portland and all that. Yeah, West Coast. Except except my mom's family and they like I grew up even when we lived in in Washington, my mom still cooks, you know, cooked beans and ham hocks and cooked <laughs> southern food, which is when, when I'm a kid, I just want to eat pizza. You know? <laughs> what is, is your cooking for me? But uh, yeah, it's definitely, I mean, and the other thing is my dad was Chinese. My mom was Caucasian, which was unusual in the 60s. In retrospect, it was like Bruce Lee and my dad, you know. Right. There are, whether you're true or not, right, like stereotypes about white people in the South. And then the fact that you have these Southern roots on the white side of your family. And the, but I was just curious, like in the 60s, what was the reaction of that side of the family when she married your father? Because the, you mentioned Bruce Lee, like there's that famous scene in Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, when uh, Linda's mom meets meets Bruce for the first time, or meets Jason Scott Lee as Bruce. And did you hear of those stories? Did your parents ever share the stories of what it was like to date in the 60s when, like you said, interracial relationships like that was very rare? Particularly like Asian men, white women. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's stuff they shared and then stuff I... I gleaned um, the stuff they shared was that, you know, for my aunt and my grandmother and stuff like that was that my, my mom had been married before. So she already had four children and, you know, a single mom with four kids in the sixties is, you know, that's, that's not a swipe right moment for <laughs> a lot of people, but they had mutual friends that connected them and they hit it off. And what my dad did on their first date, he took all of them out to dinner to like a real fancy place. Um, wasn't just take the mom out and pretend the kids don't exist. He was like, you're a package deal. Like, mm -hmm. let's let's do this. And that totally won over my Southern family. Like that was a big gesture. And I, I think that, that'd be a big gesture today, you know? And th there were stories like that. And then there were the omissions, which were my dad never went to the South. When I was younger, you know, I, I'm assuming it's, you know, my, the first time I was ever on an airplane, we flew to Little Rock and my mom prepped me ahead of time because you can see in that photo with me, with my cousins, like, obviously I'm the Chinese kid. In that. <laughs> it's not hard to pick me out. And not just because I have like, I'm wearing striped socks and a striped shirt. The little bowl cut kind of thing. Yeah, totally. <laughs> but she said that, you know, people may look at you differently. People may ask you, you know, what are you? Where are you from? And she told me I should tell them I'm Eurasian, which that was kind of the term in the mm -hmm. Vietnam era. And that in some circles would would get you a pass because they would think you were the son of a GI, you know, mm -hmm. and that was somehow more acceptable than just, you know, the son of an immigrant. And that's what I said. That's what I told people. No one really gave me a hard time or anything like that. But even if I did, I, I was a little kid, I would notice. And then when I was older, I realized we didn't go back because my dad was really scrappy and my dad got in lots of fights <laughs> and often racially motivated fights. And my dad taught martial arts in addition to running you know, a Chinese restaurant. And so... I think my mom was afraid, like, my dad's going to go to Arkansas, get in a fight and end up in some Southern jail, which is not where. <laughs> not I'm ideal. Hurt. Not yeah. ideal. I mean, that, this is like, in 1963, Birmingham had that, those four girls were killed. They were all exonerated. And then like two months later, there was an article in Life Magazine where they said, yeah, we did it. And that was. <laughs> well, that's, the, I mean, it's the 60s, right? Like, it's not, it's not like today like just kind of even thinking like it's like something out of a movie something out of a a book it's not like it's hard to imagine that being real life this, especially in the ozarks where even today there are no people of color right and i mean i i'm sure there's a lot of reasons but i you know one of the reasons is outside of georgia the largest presence of the clan was arkansas and in the 
early 1900s, they drove everybody out. It was so bad in Marshall. Like Marshall, people, people are like, Marshall, it's this, um, you know, uh, it's, it's the Ozarks. It's every stereotype you could imagine. But it is sometimes, and sometimes it's, you know, it's refreshingly not. And Marshall actually had an anti clan newspaper in the 20s because I was, I was stunned to learn that after they had driven everybody out, the clan still needed someone to harass. And there was a railroad strike, and the clan became the labor enforcers for people that, that were striking. Um, which is so weird. Like, I, like, and I'm sure they were paid. You know, I'm sure that wasn't something they did for some uh, no philosoph- reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure they were just paid off. But well, that, that kind of that you know that also like proves the point that like even if if white supremacists got what they wished, like they're ethno national state, they would you know like you said they still need someone to like harass. So it's like yeah. there's no utopia for white nationalism. Just yeah, round just- up all the gingers. You know, just- <laughs> Exactly. That's the predicate for getting you on the podcast. And now I get to talk to you about your books and stuff. So, oh. <laughs> but <laughs> okay. so that's it. That's all we, that's all we got to talk about. No, but because I, you know, I was wondering that like, you know, how deep your experience was with that part of your family, that part of the country, because, you know, like I said, I, I knew you had ties to the Northwest and I know that you currently live in Montana, which I guess has some kind of like analogs in the sense that like montana is a very sparsely populated place with not a lot of people of color but there's a lot of cows you know? <laughs> but yeah. you know I, i'm just curious that like have those experience ever sparked anything where you would like set maybe your, another a novel in the future in a, in that part of the world is that something that intrigues you at least yeah that's probably gonna happen <laughs> that's that's it needs to happen just to sort of get it out of my system and and any honestly just to go down those little research rabbit holes and learn a bit more about my family, what they were all about. But, but I, I do really, you know, it's, it's a different experience there. When I was a little kid, my grandma, she would give me $2 to go to the store and buy her snuff back when little kids could buy tobacco products. And then I could buy Tootsie Rolls with the change, but my, my grandma chewed tobacco. I mean, that yeah. she was like Southern butt kicking woman that I, I wouldn't want to mess with. You know, not to presume, but I think part of the reason that this podcast exists is that, like, I wanted there to be stories of Asian Americans who grew up in the South in particular, but or had, like, ties to the South, because particularly for Asian Americans, like, that that concept, that story, that idea, like, Asian American person in the South, like, unheard of, right? And, you know, thank God for, like, Minari last year, because that was, like, the first time people realized, like, there were Asians in the South, and, like, yeah, I've been doing this podcast for five years, guys, come on. But that's the, like, point, like, because I, someone who grew up in the rural South, I grew up in a small town in Virginia, the point you were making earlier about, like, the people who live there, you know, I think there is this caricature that a lot of people have of what the south is too right and i think you know as someone who grew up in the south who did i did experience you know bouts of racism here and there but also like i loved my childhood growing up i mean part of like my adulthood you can see behind me with all the toys is just recapturing those you know nostalgia drugs from from when i was a kid too but like so i think that it's it's a complicated relationship that i think we have with the south as as a country reckoning with that and acknowledging its flaws and its sins, but also acknowledging that, like, you know, you said there was an anti-Klan paper in the 20s. Like, there were people who were actively fighting back against the racism and the injustice. We can't just ignore that part of the country, like, politically, and just as well, you know, let's write them off. We have to fight for that. We have to fight for that and reclaim that part, too. So I'm just glad that, you know, to hear you have these same thoughts. And and again, I just think a, a Jamie Ford novel set in Arkansas would just be... (laughs) <laughs> the bee's knees is all I'm saying. It's uh, you never know, and I'm sure you've seen you know the the videos of the Chinese in Mississippi. Yeah, of course. It's so cool to see someone who is you know they're Chinese and they they have that that Mississippi drawl. You know, <laughs> in Marshall, where my family is, it has a problematic history, but people there are so darn nice. You know, they're small town nice where. They, everybody knows everybody, you know, they're greeted warmly and sincerely. And even in Montana, like I've never seen a car on the side of the road where people don't stop and assist. 
And in California, that's, you know, that's, that never happens <laughs> here. It's like a race to like, Oh, like three cars are going to stop and we're all going to get out and push. And you still retain that sort of whatever that cultural thing is in a, in a small town. And in the South, you have small towns plus, I don't know, just sort of a, an attitude of that's expected, I think in some, in some neighborhoods. I mean, Southern hospitality is a real thing and, and, yeah. you know, it comes from somewhere, but, and I think to your point about like, what what we've seen over the over the course of like just American history too is I think whenever you see any kind of division, a lot of that is just exploited for other nefarious reasons, right? Like I'm not excusing the act of you know racist, but like a lot of times people's racism is just being fueled by fear and yeah. by scapegoating and oh. and a lot of a lot of folks who would who would probably not be racist if they we're able to empathize and, and see the humanity in other people, right? Like, because it's cognitive dissonance that, like, Southern hospitality and Southern racism feels like cognitively dissonant. How can one go out of the way and be so nice to their fellow man, but also, like, make these assumptions and make these prejudices against that same man? Right. You know, but so what? what, what is what is triggering that, like, sense of otherness? That oh I I can't help that it's dehumanization right like you're Hello. you know I'm I'm glad I'm talking to you as a writer because I think storytelling is how we get there like we've been telling ourselves these stories that dehumanize people of color for so long that it just ingrains itself into people that's what the clan did they thought of themselves as superheroes right like that's how they 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 were the heroes of their own story they in their minds they were the Justice League right yeah isn't that scary yeah and that's what's that's what's scary about all of this you know. Yeah, Hitler thought he was wearing the white hat, you yeah. know. Paul Pop thought he was wearing the white hat. Oy. <laughs> this, yeah, get me going on the South. I, I love it there too, you know what I mean? But I do think, I think, I think that racism is actually baked in, uh, I think it's epigenetic, honestly. And uh, my new book is a lot about epigenetics and, and it, not just heritable traits like height and hair color, but psychological traits. Mm -hmm. I think if you have people whose ancestors go back to slavery and they were taught that these people of color were property and they were animals and they were others and they weren't human and the Bible backs you up, they, they have this ingrained fear and also an ingrained weird sense of superiority, right. which is strange because you can have two identically dirt poor families, but the white people are, you know, they, they feel proud that they're somehow superior. I, I do think it is, it's baked into the DNA somehow. I mean, it's, that's kind of a really far-fetched theory, but I, I think there's something there. Well, I think there is, I mean, I think there's, you know, actual studies of like how trauma is passed down in DNA. So I can, I can see like it, the reverse is also true. Again, it goes back to the notion of what stories are you telling yourselves, right? Because, and, and who is benefiting from that? Cause to your point about like two equally poor families, you know, the, the white family just thinks they're superior because of the stories they've told themselves or the stories they've been told or the stories Fox News tells them or one yeah. of the political parties in our country tells them. And But to whose benefit is that? That's the thing, right? Like, it's always like, what's wrong with Kansas? You know, like, you right. vote against your own self-interest just to feel superior. And yeah, of course, the the narrative that's drummed up to the gen up ratings is always the most sensational. Like, I live in Montana and we have there's farmers along the Canadian border that are convinced, you know, Syrian refugees are coming to take their jobs. If only. <laughs> you know, Someone needs to do those jobs. <laughs> cool. Yeah, see that happen. I, I'm proud that my family's from the South. And it's, you know, there's a there's a 360 degree look at history. And, and it's very easy for us just to look at certain uh, angles of approach and only see one part of the story. I, I do think in, in towns, in the small towns in Arkansas, where, well, probably any towns, I think when people of color have parity, when there's, you know, population parity, I think that's when, you know, Caucasian people are at their, <laughs> what's the, the raciest, racist, whatever, <laughs> the most racist, when it's the town and there's like the one black kid in high school then his difference is usually celebrated or unique or something because he's not a threat. Right. And with economic parity, I think they get, you know, it's very easy for people in power to scapegoat one against the other. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that's 90% of the time of the culprit is, is some sort of 
scapegoating strategy from again someone in a higher position of power that right. that is exploiting that division we saw in the last you know the the, the backlash to the obama presidency the, the with the trump presidency kind of like supercharging the virulence and and, and as asian americans right like we, we've seen in the last two years like how that you know it, it, asian americans were the model minority we felt like we could sit outside that like black white divide and what we, we again some of us Tried to tell y'all, like, you can't sit outside, you can't pick a side, uh, or you have to pick a side, basically, right? You're either standing for white supremacy or against it. But we saw what happened to Asian Americans over the last couple of years because of that supercharged racism that social media, I think, hasn't helped. <laughs> and in fact, it's, it's accelerated, you know? Yeah, I, I do think giving up prejudices and bigotry, it's like, for many people, it's like learning a different language speaking with empathy and compassion for them it's new and they're not that fluent in it and then in moments of strife they retreat to their mother tongue which and you see that where there's like a person that is a normal like you see him he's a you see his linkedin photo and he looks like a nice guy and he goes to this church and he you know he has nice children and then the next thing you know is you he's at like you know, uh, <laughs> he's trying to he's trying to sack the capital of the United States of America. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or I was going to say just like screaming racial stuff at a Froyo place, you know, because yeah, right. something didn't go his way. But right, you're right. right. And I, I think people, re- they do retreat in those moments of stress. Those words come out because mm-hmm. they I mean, there was a whole generation of people that went to church and then came home and used the N word over Sunday dinner. You know, and that was just their normal. Right. Even. My, my ex-mother-in-law, who's a lovely woman, when my wife and I got, you know, when she got pregnant, she said, wow, you're going to have yellow babies. And I was just like, so there's a different way you can say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I did want to give you an opportunity to talk about the book that's coming out this summer. It's your fourth book? Yeah. You know, if Hotel was my my freshman effort, this is my, my senior effort. You're graduating. Yeah. I'm going <laughs> you know, to launch into the world now. Yeah, it's doing, it doesn't come out for a while, but it's, it's doing some interesting things. Like before I got on this, I w- was writing a thank you note to Sarah Jessica Parker. I was about to say you got the Instagram co-sign by Carrie Bradshaw herself. How cool is that? Yeah, that was wild. And there's some other things like that happening that I, I, I can't, I can't talk about. Sure. One, I don't want to, you know, jinx it, but two is I just can't because people would be upset. And, no, I understand. NDAs yeah. and all, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and, it, and it may never happen. It could just, you know, it could just poof and disappear. But it's, you know, I, this book is, it's definitely a, uh, an evolution for me. You know, I, I normally write historical fiction, but in short fiction, I write everything. I write steampunk and crime noir. And I mean, I, we, we collaborate on superhero comics. So I know that you, always, I write you all have a it. range. Yeah. And this one is it's historical, but it's also speculative because it goes to around 2045 and even up to like 2085 in an epilogue. It has, you know, soft sci-fi elements. Oh, it wow. Has... I didn't know that. Well, so what, what, can you can you tell our listeners what A Fong Moi is about? Yeah, it's it's really, I mean, it's about inherited trauma, but I, I kind of jokingly call it my epigenetic love story. The genetic line, you know, instead of exploring just the genetics of earlobes and things like this, it is looking at inheritance of psychological behavior from trauma to how we interact with our parents to the ability or inability to love other people. And it does a deep dive into all of that. And we go from the genetic line of uh, Epang Moy. And, you know, in reality, she probably didn't have any any children that that we know of i mean who knows she, she it's 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 probably a coin flip but i've always thought that the thought of you know someone walking around here as a direct descendant and not knowing it it's like if they were a direct descendant of you know thomas jefferson or something and not knowing it and so it it goes from there to actually the main the main character is set in 2045 and it threads through all these different timelines from china during world war ii to England in the 20s, San Francisco in the late 1800s when they had a plague epidemic to contemporary times. When there's a plague epidemic. <laughs> yeah, another plague epidemic. And it, yeah, it, it weaves through all these things and it has, it's funny because I just write it. I don't know what to call it. 
but as the reviews come in, they're like, it's magical realism or it's fantasy or it's, it crosses a whole bunch of genres, which I'm, I'm really happy about. I didn't really do it on purpose, but I just wanted to tell the story I wanted to tell. And that's kind of how it shakes out. Yeah, no, it's, I'm excited for it because again, you know, like I've, I've seen you in the, in the more sci-fi realm with the, with the stuff you've done with us at Secret Identities. And do, do you have any more like designs to do comics? Oh, gosh. And what is it? What is that experience for you? Because I, I know that you were showing off your your X Men collection earlier. Oh, uh, I, I've got I've got so many comics. I've downsized and then I re upsized and I downsized and I re. I probably have downstairs. I probably have ten short boxes and eight long boxes, and then I have about six hundred graded comics. Yeah, you- like, yeah. I actually bought Harlan Ellison's Silver Age collection. He's a famous writer in the sixties and seventies and eighties. And yeah, I like 10 years ago, I, mm. I bought them and had them graded. And like everyone listening is just like turning the channel, turning. <laughs> Not, no, this is on the nerds of color, bro. Like, don't worry about it. This is exactly yeah. the, the type of folks who, yeah, who would so, be, they're more interested in this and to talk about racism really. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, let's, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I've always if if one of the big two or maybe it's not a big two comic book company, but we're like what who what is who do you want to knock on the door or ring the phone and say, Hey Jamie, we want you to do a twelve issue run on this. Oh what would it, be? it would be, you know, any of the biggies or the sub biggies. You know, I don't Marvel D C but IDW and I mean there's a ton like but there's I, not that one character that you just want to do. You want to do their definitive twelve issue yeah, matter reader lad, matter reader lad. That's it. <laughs> nice. Well, you know he's he's got a bit of a he's got a bit of a, a come up on the on the profile because they 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 reference him on Peacemaker recently. So, <laughs> dude, okay, there might gotta, be a matter eater lad miniseries from DC coming soon. Is all I'm saying. I actually my you know my favorite. I love the Legion Legion of Superheroes. It's been rebooted and the continuity has been screwed with so many times that it's just a hot mess but that was a huge favorite i mean I, I, all, all the biggies i like i collect the stuff of my childhood but what i read now is not superheroes it's like saga or bitch right. planet or sex criminals or something like that basically anything image puts out at this yeah. point right? yeah a lot of those things but i i'd love to write for any of them and it, and it goes back to the south my my Southern grandma, Verna Blackwell, would go to the garage sales and buy comics, put them in a box and send them to me. Oh, wow. Is, oh, that, where the, is that where the love came from? Oh, yeah. When when the UPS man knocked on the door when I was like eight years old, that was like Christmas. You know, I wow. would get a box of comics. And yeah, that's been a, a love ever since. That's awesome. As I mentioned earlier, your first published comic work was in Secret Identities. Yeah, back in two thousand nine, two months again as as I said after yeah. Hotel came out, H- Hotel is still like your your definitive work. Every everyone knows Hotel in the Corner of Bitterness. It's so wild, like just to think that you know your books were sold in fucking like airports and <laughs> you know what I mean. That's just it's like living the life, man. But like Hotel, I know that, and you can't may or may not be able to talk about. I know the Hotel has gone through some like potential adaptations and things like that. Where are we? Yeah, you know one one thing I. My wife says I have terminal honesty. If you just ask, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> which I, I need to learn to rein it in. Yeah. But the musical got really far along. They did a bunch of 29 hour readings and they, they actually raised a ton of money to produce it. And most of that money came from one large donor who insisted on selecting the producer. And the producer basically assembled an all white production crew wow i'm not joking like 20 people and their diversity was well this guy he's russian like (laughs) no i don't think putin sees himself as a minority (laughs) i may be wrong about this but that was the people that developed it were uh laney sakakura and paul fujimoto Japanese Americans who had family go to internment camps and they were really upset. I mean, they were, they were so upset. I didn't have time to be upset. That's kind of probably just like the reality of the theater world too, right? Like the great white way. It's it's called that for a reason, you know? And I know that again, hotel is such, such a important work of art, right? That, and not that so many people have already read it, but you know, like we're, we're in an age where like, all the best books are turned into like people don't even do movie adaptations anymore, right? Like if anything, it would be like a 
10 episode Hulu series at this point? Like, is that something that appeals to you? Like, do you, would you want to see these characters be portrayed by actors or is it like to you, do you feel like, you know, ultimately like reading it is the best experience way to experience these stories. It's a double-edged thing. I, I, I want to see it in another form, but I don't want to see it ruined, you know? Yeah. It's really rolling the dice. Lisa C had her book, Snowflower and the Secret Fan, come out. And she, you know, when it came out, she was very clear. She said, there's the book and there's the movie and they're they're vaguely connected. Yeah, Lainey and Paul, they walked from that deal. And so they're looking, you know, they're starting again. And the film for Hotel, I, th- I think they envision it as a series now, but like seven or eight years ago, a friend sent me a list and it was like the top 15 book club books of the last 20 years. And all of them had been made into a film except mine. <laughs> and it does my leads are Chinese, Japanese, and black, you know, I'm a, and that was hard. Like we ran into these issues with <sighs> trying to get the film made because there was no star to attach to it. You and know? What, you know, what I find interesting too, is that like the time, you, like when you think of, one, you know, we did Secret Identities in 2009 because we were like, there are no Asian American superheroes, right? Right. And then now in 2022, it's like, there's too many fucking Asian American superheroes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And like, like the, the, the pop culture landscape has evolved so much since Hotel came out, right? Because to your point, like seven years ago, yeah, we were having, I was, my New York Times essay about why won't Hollywood cast Asian actors came out in 2016, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Like they kind of presaged the whole movement of the last yeah. few years where like crazy rich Asians and so do you feel like if anything, we are in a better place for a potential hotel? Definitely. And I and I say that because my new book, I would bet that it will make it to the screen before hotel. And it's the the the, the environment's different. Before yeah. it was every reason to say no and now it's where can we find you know our our asian property and right. how to star to it and so it's yeah it's like rolling down a hill whereas before you know we, we had to climb a fence just to get to the hill right i mean you know henry golding's got to have a movie to star in it might as well be henry lee so <laughs> anyway jamie before we go i do i do have a segment on this podcast where i ask all of my guests like what is the one dish or cuisine that brings them back to their southern roots because you know if there's oh. anything asians and southerners overlap on it's this like unabiding love of food so i know and i know you posted some photos on your social media of waffle house but i don't know if that was exactly the place but is there what is there like a dish or something from your that your relatives cook or that that you that you had for the first time maybe this most recent trip to arkansas like what is the what's the thing that like brings you back to to arkansas and the ozarks this is this is very arkansas i mean i mean in arkansas in general have you heard of chocolate gravy yes i have actually that's a thing that's very, you know, that's indigenous to <laughs> place to Arkansas. And maybe they have it in Mississippi and other places, but Arkansas claims it. But within Searcy County, Arkansas, they have this thing called the chocolate roll. You know, I, I made one when I came home just to show my wife what it is. And it's basically like, if, and I think back to my, my mom growing up where they lived in this little, basically a cabin with no running water or electricity and a wood stove and there's no store. And if you wanted to make something sweet and you had flour, sugar, cocoa powder and butter, this is what you would make. And it's basically a pie crust with like a stick of butter, a ton of sugar and a bunch of cocoa powder and you roll it up and you just bake it. And it's kind of crispy on the outside and it's mushy chocolate molten stuff on the inside. It's It tastes like a heart attack <laughs> and you buy them. They have a, a chocolate roll festival in Marshall but it's something that people make. You can't find them. The only place you can find them is at a gas station right. where a lady makes them and brings them in and sells them for two bucks a piece. Nice. So they're called chocolate rolls. Chocolate rolls. It's, it's not a Swiss roll. Don't, don't, don't imagine anything that looks like Hostess or a Little a, Debbie. Yeah, you're right. France. No, this is like crust and molten goo and it's delicious. But anything that sounds like it tastes like a heart attack has to be delicious. Otherwise, yeah, like why yeah. risk it? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> well, that sounds great. Jamie, 
Thanks again. How can people who want to find more out about you on the internet find you? Oh, uh, I'm on Twitter at Jamie Ford, Instagram, Jamie Ford Official, Facebook, the normal places, website, just being overhauled at the moment, but the normal places. You Google around. Also, I always have the have the disclaimer, there is a Playboy model named Jamie Ford. So be make careful. sure you're not at work. <laughs> you know? Be careful when you Google Jamie Ford. Well, yeah. Jamie, I will be sure to pick up The Many Daughters of A Fong Moy when it comes out in June of this year. That's the plan. All right. Thanks so much, Jamie. Oh, thanks, Keith. Take care. You can find me, Keith Chow, on Twitter at the real Chow, the underscore real underscore Chow. Follow the podcast at Southern Asians on Twitter and at Southern Fried Asians on Instagram. Go to hardknockmedia.com to find this and all of the podcasts in the Hard Knock Media Network. Subscribe and download Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Spotify, anywhere you get podcasts. Support us on patreon.com slash nerdscolor. Also find us on GoFundMe. As always, Southern Fried Asian is co-produced by Jess Vu. Email us at nerdscolor at gmail.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel youtube.com slash the nerds of color and until next time keep it southern fried y'all